Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our uh, panel discussion on uh, Peach State Politics, which is a virtual panel discussion hosted by the Department of Political Science and the School of Education and Behavioral Sciences and co-sponsored by the uh, MGA student, Political Science Student Organization, as well as the uh, Alpha Mu Zeta chapter of Pi Sigma Alpha, which is the National Honorary Society for Students of Political Science. Uh, and uh, the, so today what we're going to do is uh, talk a bit about um, events in uh, state and local politics. Um, and uh, before we do that, though, I did want to very briefly give those of you that are unfamiliar with a little bit of uh, information about our department. Uh, so uh, we offer several programs, both on campus and online. Um, so we offer the Bachelor of Science degree in Political Science, as well as Bachelor of Science in Interdisciplinary Studies, uh, as well as minors in uh, Political Science, African African Diaspora Studies, Environmental Policy Studies, uh, Global Studies, Pre-Law, and uh, starting in the fall of 2004, uh, local government administration. Uh, we also are a participant in the uh, Certificate in European Union Studies offered by the uh, University System of Georgia. And uh, we are also a participant as well in uh, our uh, School of Education Behavioral Sciences program uh, that is the uh, Doctor of Science in Public uh, Safety. Uh, let's see, so I wanna introduce our panelists for today. Um, First, we have uh, Dr. Julie Lester, who is a professor of political science and has been here at Middle Georgia State since 2007. Uh, her PhD is in American Studies from Purdue University in Indiana. Uh, we also have uh, Dr. John Hall, who is an associate professor of political science. Uh, he has been here at Middle Georgia State since 2015. And uh, his doctorate is in public policy and administration uh, from Auburn University in Auburn, in Indiana, or yeah, Auburn, Alabama. Not Indiana. Um, I don't even know if there is an Auburn now, uh, Indiana. Um, and then uh, last but not least, um, I'll be your moderator today. Uh, I am uh, Christopher Lawrence. I'm professor and chair of the department, uh, and uh, my PhD is in political science, and I've been here at MJ since 2012. Um, so we're going to uh, start with a few topics that have been selected by our panelists. Um, and then, uh, but we also want your questions as well. So if you do have questions, uh, please post those in the chat window. Um, a couple of ground rules, while audience members are certainly welcome to ask multiple questions, we do want to prioritize answering one question per person. Um, um, and then, um, so if you have more than one question, um, you know, please, uh, we'll certainly take it, um, but, uh, Sorry, I lost my train of thought there, but, um, but um, almost like somebody came into my office. Um, but um, what was I saying? Oh yes. Um, so um, so while we're prioritize as answering one question, more than one. If you have more than one question, feel free to ask it. But uh, we do want to prioritize making sure everybody gets an opportunity to ask at least one question. Uh, also, uh, please be courteous and civil to each other in the chat window. Um, and uh, Dr. Lester is having some technical difficulties, um, and so um, we're gonna, uh, I guess probably what we'll do is we'll go ahead and start with our first question in just a moment for, and we'll have uh, Dr. Hall uh, answer it and then uh, go from there, but um, let's see. Um, so, um, so some of the things we're gonna talk about this evening uh, include, or this afternoon include, uh, the budget, uh, some uh, legislation on various topics as well, including education, elections, gambling, environmental policy and issues, um, some social issues, so-called Franken bills, if you will, uh, and then uh, taxes as well. Uh, we're also, uh, and of course, we're also going to take questions from the chat as well. So uh, let me um, go ahead and minimize our share window here. And um, that's not unsharing. Uh, ah, there we go. That will unshare. Um, hit the wrong button. So, um, so I guess for Dr. Hall, uh, first question. Um, uh, so tomorrow is what's called sign a die. Um, so uh, just very briefly, could you explain while Dr. Lesher gets back online, perhaps, uh, what sign a die is and how it relates to the General Assembly's calendar? Absolutely. Um, great question. The sign or die um, is a reference at the Georgia legislative level of the last day of the session. Uh, for those of you who don't know, for all the students here, uh, 
and thank you all for coming out by the way thank you for the faculty members that are here um the georgia legis legislative session lasts for 40 days uh and we just reached day 40. so sign or die is the end if your legislation has not been passed through both chambers to the house and the senate um then it is dead effectively now we do have something similar to that at the congressional level for our American government students. But since Congress is in session almost year round, it's not a part time Congress the way most state legislatures are. Uh, sign or die is literally that it, it literally translates into adjourning without a day, meaning we are adjourning and there is nothing coming up next. Um, it basically means the end of the session. If it hasn't passed yet. If it hasn't at least made it into a position where the governor can sign or veto. It is dead. OK, great. And it looks like uh, Dr. Lester is back with us. So um, hopefully we got those technical difficulties out of the way and are, are back on track. So uh, unless uh, Dr. Lester has anything to add to that, uh, I think we'll just go ahead to our next question. Um, uh, I did want to add something really quick. Um, the Georgia State Legislature, the Georgia General Assembly were a biennial sessions so this is actually the second year of the current session so last year some as we'll get into today last year some bills that didn't make it through signing die actually re-emerged um and did make it through and, and one that i'm pretty sure we're going to talk about that was um on the news a lot lately um and also to sign die traditionally um ended at midnight but in the last few sessions it hasn't ended at midnight so it actually may go on till friday morning depending how much they need to do tomorrow and if you're really into this type of stuff a tradition that they have is they rip up a bunch of papers at the end of it and throw it so on friday um if you want to see this go to the atlanta journal constitution's newspaper and they usually post it on their website the big picture them ripping everything up so it's kind of one of those interesting little traditions they do uh yep thanks um good points all so um so i guess we'll start with our uh first subset question which is uh one of the uh, critical tasks of the general assembly every year is to establish a budget for the upcoming fiscal year um so what are the highlights of the upcoming uh budget for fiscal year 2025 so the budget that will start in july 1st and then also, um, if any, any uh, any highlights of the amended budget that uh, was passed earlier in the or, or earlier in the session. Sorry, I have marbles in my mouth today. Um, I don't know who wanted to jump on that. I can hit some of the basics here for us uh, regarding the budget. Uh, when you look at the, the General Assembly's budget that's coming through, it's gonna. It looks like it'll wind up being roughly. Uh, 36 billion dollars. Uh, there is additional revenue. There is some additional spending, several billion dollars extra. Uh, there will be additional spending on cost of living increases, for example, for state workers. That's something that's important to all of us here who are, in fact, state workers. Uh, there's also about a quarter of a billion dollars in additional money uh, to deal with student enrollment growth. We have a couple of hundred million dollars to handle basic infrastructure like buying additional school buses. Um, there are a number of specific line items that the current uh, budget is looking at increasing. Uh, there are almost $400 million increase uh, for base salary for K through 12 uh, teachers. Um, in addition to the money that we discussed, about a half a billion for adjusting for K through 12 enrollment increases. Georgia is a state on the rise, and that is something that the legislative body has had to take into consideration. Uh, there are also additional increases in funding for health care, uh, for different programs, for infrastructure. Uh, we could keep going on that all night long, but I'll stop right there just in case I'm losing anyone and hand it over to Julie. Thank you. No, I think you did a good job. Something interesting to think about the budgetary process, what how that actually works is that the governor puts together and his staffers put together a proposed budget and what they want. Basically, like you're putting together your Christmas wish list, but we know separation of powers and how government works is that the legislature actually has to pass it. And so sometimes what the governor wants is in the budget and sometimes it isn't. Um, so it's important to think about this. Something interesting about the governor's proposal was that um, this year, the fiscal year 2025, which will begin July 1, uh, increased 
per person spending above Georgia's pre-pandemic level for the first time. So since 2020, this is the first time a proposed budget has actually increased per person, per Georgia resident um, spending. And when you're looking at the budget as a whole and the proposal that the governor put forth, um, over 50% of that money actually will go to education. Um, when you think of K through 12, pre-K and higher education. So education takes out traditionally the largest chunk of the budget, then healthcare is traditionally the second largest chunk of the budget um, in Georgia. And as Dr. Hall was talking about, there's been um, a rush in the last few days uh, to get the budget passed because actually technically the only thing the Georgia state legislature has to do during the legislative session is pass a budget. So tomorrow we will we will get the actual budget passed. Um, if you've been following this, you'll note that the Senate made some changes to the version of the budget that was passed in the House. The House has to inter introduce the budget, and so they're kind of um, fleshing out those those differences and in, in related to who's going to get pay raises, who isn't going to get pay raises, how we're going to fund education, um, and. For example, the Senate added money in their budget for literacy coaches, and they took money out for free and reduced price lunches for kids in K through 12. The Senate removed some money that would help fund judge pay raises, but they added money for school safety. And in this school safety uh, is five million dollars is actually to pay teachers. And this again, K through 12, a $10,000 stipend to carry guns. And you're like, why did the Senate do that? Well, the stipend to carry guns was part of an initiative that uh, Burt Jones wanted, a member of the Senate, as the lieutenant governor. <laughs> so there kind of was pushing his agenda through the budget. So again, you're seeing the politics at play. You have the lieutenant governor who was also engaged with the Senate, trying to get his agenda passed through there as well. So we'll see tomorrow uh, what the budget is actually looks like for the next fiscal year, because, again, that's the one thing that they have to do before signy die. Thank you, Julie. Uh, great point there, identifying what we spend money on. Chris, I didn't know if you had that pulled up. I uh, emailed you the budget. It's a little pie chart that. Uh, uh, yeah, I can read that. Up, yeah. It's, it's interesting to note that we spend as a state over 70 percent of the entire budget. As, as Dr. Lester was pointing out, on either education or healthcare. Uh, Pre-K through 12th grade represents about 38%. Higher education is 15 and healthcare is the remaining 21. So everything else that the Georgia government does is represented in a little over 25% of what is left of the budget. Yep, there you go. It's on there. So this is a huge chunk of what Georgia does. It's, an, it's why budgets are so fascinating. Budgets don't lie. They tell you what you do, what you're interested in. And the state of Georgia is overwhelmingly uh, involved in uh, primary, secondary, and post-secondary education and healthcare. Everything else that, gov that the government of Georgia does is represented in those tiny little slivers. Uh, yeah, that's a that's a great point by uh, Dr. Hall there. So um, let me say I need to bring up my questions again. Um, so um, so we talked a little bit about education already uh, in terms of some of the budget increases. Um, beyond that, has the legislature done anything significant or does it seem like it's doing anything significant uh, affecting either K through 12 or higher education during this session? I don't know if Dr. Lester, if you wanted to start on that one. Okay. Um, there's been some discussions and some movement um, toward workforce development initiatives, and there were some study committees on occupations over the summer and, and um, last year as well. Um, something that's gotten a lot of attention was actually, and I think we'll talk about it probably a little later, it's tying it to a, a, a social issue here is about our libraries in the state of Georgia and our K through 12 libraries and um, requiring them to let parents know about the materials that their children are checking out from the libraries. Mm -hmm. uh, so basically parental notification. And also too, um, there's been some movement on changing how sex education works in the state of Georgia. Basically it's not a, Potentially, if it goes through, it wouldn't be allowed until sixth grade. And instead of 
families, parents, guardians um, having to opt out of the education. Um, they would actually have to opt in. And then, of course, the parents and guardians would have access to see the materials that school districts are using when it comes to these types of uh, conversation. So that's that's some stuff that's going on in, in K through 12 in, in education. Great point there, Julie. Uh, again, as we'd mentioned, the state has some basic uh, recognitions of the growth of the state, the growth of our primary and secondary student bodies. Again, there's a, about uh, almost a quarter of a billion dollars uh, that this current uh, budget uh, is putting up accounting for student enrollment growth across the entire state. Uh, again, we have infrastructure uh, development and increasing again the number of school buses. Um, there are safety uh, grants upgrading security uh, on public school campuses. I think that was uh, roughly over a hundred million dollars. And we also have um, over $50 million that is going to the University System of Georgia uh, that will help to alleviate cuts that were made in the past. Uh, so with this budget, while still maintaining an extraordinarily robust uh, surplus uh, in the Georgia coffers, there are some uh, spending increases at uh, all levels, primary, secondary, and post-secondary. And I actually forgot the biggest bill that passed, and I apologize, school vouchers. <laughs> I was like, just reading an article about earlier today. So uh, this was what an example when I mentioned earlier about the uh, biennial session and how sometimes bills don't make it through the first year, but they come back alive the second year and pass through. And this bill is an example of that. Obviously, there were some changes from last year, but basically um, this is a, a priority of uh, the Republican administration to create $6,500 vouchers that students, again, this is K through 12, in public schools that are considered struggling, um, they could, the students could use that money to attend private schools or to help cover um, homeschool expenses. Now, of course, there's some standards attached, definitions of what is struggling, and it goes back to the Georgia code and Georgia law for some of those definitions. But that was probably, I would say, in education, probably the biggest um, newsmaker as far as state policy goes in this legislative session, because um, people who've been advocating for this type of voucher system have been doing it for many, many years, and they finally got the right formula for success this time around. And that's a great point that we may uh, address a little later. It's interesting to note that when, you, when we talk about school vouchers, $6,500 to parents to send their kids to private schools, that is overwhelmingly advantageous if you want to do that, but it also represents $6,500 that is removed from public education funding to public schools. So depending on how you look at school vouchers, it can be a way to escape failing public schools, but others look at look at it as something of an abandonment of public education in general. So it's a it's an extraordinarily controversial topic that Georgia has jumped into uh, in a very, very strong way with this new legislation. Great. Um, so, um, so let's see. A uh, um, couple things. Uh, first, uh, just a reminder to those of you that are participating that uh, um, we do have some scripted questions here, but we're also happy to have your chat questions as well. So please, please do post in the chat if you do have any questions, or if you have any follow-up questions, for, or if you need clarification, or uh, would like to talk more about something that the panel is talking about. We have lots of things to talk about, and so uh, we may give some things a little bit short shrift. Um, short shrift. Um, uh, and so, um, you know, the this is not we, but we do want to talk about what you want to talk about. And so, um, you know, if there's something that comes up that you want to talk more about, feel free to mention that in the chat. Or if there's something we're just not doesn't seem to be on our agenda um, that you want to talk about, uh, we're happy to talk about those things as well within reason. Um, so, um, so another area where the election uh, or the weather legislature has spent a lot of time and uh, energy over the last few years has been uh, on election security and related issues, particularly since the 2020 election, all the, the uh, uh, drama and contestation that that uh, resulted in. Um, this year, is the legislature considering any bills that would take any further actions in this area? Um, John, do you want to take that one? Yes, uh, yeah, uh, just to bring us all up to speed, when you look at Georgia's 
legislation regarding voting rights. As we have learned in all of our American government courses, if you were to answer the following question in the most simple way, who's in charge of elections in Georgia? The answer is Georgia. This is constitutionally prescribed. Uh, states are given power over the time, place, and manner of elections. Overwhelmingly, unless they get outside of constitutional barriers, the state of Georgia is in charge of elections in the state of Georgia. And a couple of years ago, uh, Georgia passed some relatively controversial legislation that impacted Georgia voting laws. And recently, the uh, legislation coming out of Atlanta is looking to change it even further. To remind ourselves of some of the older election laws that were passed, uh, the state of Georgia changed, uh, for example, drop boxes. I don't know if any how many people that are listening have had the opportunity to vote at or above the age of 18. But after, uh, particularly during COVID in 2020, the drop boxes became an extraordinarily convenient way for Georgia voters to vote while avoiding uh, contact with a large number of people. The old legislation that was passed after 2020 uh, actually changed the number of drop boxes that each county is allowed. They significantly reduced the number of drop boxes uh, compared to the old system. Um, they also changed, uh, making it either more difficult to vote or more secure, depending on your political affiliation. Um, they changed how absentee ballots were processed. In the past, simply checking um, signatures was enough, but now under the new legislation, uh, you have to provide driver's license numbers and other forms of voter ID. De again, depending on how you look at it, it made it harder to vote or it made it a little bit safer to vote. Again, just depending on which direction you go. Now, in terms of the current legislation, there have been a couple of changes uh, suggested. So as of right now, uh, the number of voting machines that will be available per precinct uh, has been reduced. That's something that's passed the House and the Senate. Uh, we are also looking at adding uh, watermarks to secure uh, ballot security. That's also passed the House and the Senate. And we're also looking at uh, legislation uh, that will prohibit ranked choice voting while several uh, areas in the state of Georgia are looking to experiment with ranked choice voting. We've talked about that in class. Um, identification, verification requirements, uh, changes have also passed the House, not the Senate. So many of the changes to Georgia voting laws are within the area of making it safer to vote or making it harder to vote. I think from the last legislation, we're all familiar with uh, new rules that limit your ability to, for example, take water to someone standing in line and uh, give them food or water. On the one hand, that's a human reaction to someone who's standing out in the hot Georgia sun. On the other, it's looked at as possibly um, trying to affect or impact someone's vote. So it really just depends on your political affiliation or how you look at voter election laws. But one way of summarizing past and current voter uh, registration and voter law changes is that it's not necessarily making it easier to vote. I'll leave it at that. Juliet, and if you wanted to add anything. No, I thought that was a good um, overview. And like I said, it's, it's all kind of harkening back to what happened in 2020. And if you recall, the infamous phone call to uh, the Secretary of State, Brad Raffensperger, and um, the stand that he took against, and even Kemp has in previous years not been a huge uh, uh, advocate for Trump. Of course, he's going to support him in the, the general election, but um, he's taken a little bit different stand than maybe some other governors. But um, like I said, this is just think it's good to think about the history if we're going to look at the laws, like what's driving these types of things. Um, and also, too, I think it's um, interesting that also that you mentioned um, the ranked choice voting, because there's been a real grassroots movement in Georgia, as well as other states, to try to adopt that because people get tired of runoff elections. And so this is a, a, a way to uh, eliminate those runoff elections through ranked choice voting. Um, but as Dr. Hall said, it, it didn't really get the traction that its supporters wanted in the state of Georgia. Um, and there were actually a couple of pieces of legislation tied to that that just didn't uh, make it anywhere. Uh, yeah, that's where I'm worth uh, pointing out. Uh, you know, a couple other things that I just wanted to briefly note. Uh, you know, the um, um, so the bills on uh, reducing number of required voting machines per precinct and ballot security, both of those did pass both chambers. 
So it seems likely they'll become law. Uh, the others, they might still make it, um, but that's kind of up in the air at the moment. Uh, the one thing I would add about ranked choice voting, a couple of things, I guess. Um, so um, it wouldn't be completely new to Georgia. So overseas voters already get ranked choice ballots uh, when they do a uh, – um, there are absentee ballots uh, because of the time between the election and the runoff. Um, but most absentee voters and most voters in Georgia aren't really familiar with that, where you would, again, kind of rank your candidates and then not have to do a, uh, a runoff. Uh, and there were some proposals early on, although I think it didn't really go anywhere, uh, to get rid of runoffs completely. Um, there was some discussion about doing that, uh, going to doing what most states do and just have simple plurality votes. Um, or whoever get, or first past the post, whoever gets most votes wins. Um, but uh, neither of those seem to have gotten any traction, nor has the idea of expanding ranked choice voting either. It seems to have run into a bit of hostility from, uh, I guess, the lieutenant governor in particular seemed to be particularly opposed to that for reasons that are not entirely clear um, and have not been detailed very much in the press, to be honest with you. Um, so I'm not sure why. why He's so objecting to, to it, but uh, nonetheless, um, we'll uh, go ahead and uh, move on. Um, and by the way, again, if you have any further questions about want clarification about any of this stuff, feel free to let us know. Um, so a lot of voters and some interest groups lately have been raising some concerns about some plans for mining in southeast Georgia or south Georgia, I guess. Southwest Georgia, Southeast Georgia, um, somewhere in the south of Georgia near Florida, um, uh, in the uh, area that's somewhat proximate to, near, relatively speaking to, uh, the uh, Okefenokee Swamp, um, within five miles of, I believe, is where the current uh, proposal is. Um, and so um, what, if anything, is the legislature planning to do to address these concerns? Uh, Dr. Lester, I know, is a big environmental expert, and so I'll let her kind of lead off on this one. Okay. So this is the, the bill that, the little bill that everybody is hoping it can, but realistically, it probably won't. Um, so what's the threat um, to help you all better understand? Okefenokee Swamp uh, in south, central, southeast Georgia, depends how you look at geography. Um, Twin Pines wants to mine titanium dioxide from the sands very near the swamp. Um, in the 1990s, there was actually, uh, it was DuPont back then, they wanted to mine in the area too, and it actually got national attention and the locals in the state were actually able to stop it from happening. Um, but let's fast forward to the last five to seven years. Um, there's been some changes on the national level that would open it up, make it easier to mine. So, of course, um, corporations, you know, they, they've got to make money and they're seeing this opportunity here to, to mine this product. So they want to, um, to conduct these activities. So. There was legislation last year, didn't go anywhere. This year, it, it got revived. And again, if you're reading the newspaper, it's like the little bill that they're really, really hoping because there's a lot of like community support, support amongst the citizens of Georgia. But the vibe is that it probably actually will not um, pass as far as the, the restrictions that would protect the Okefenokee. I hope that I'm wrong. Um, I'll show my bias a little bit here. Um, but um, I wouldn't be surprised if it doesn't, um, but it's uh, important to recognize that this is a battle that's been going on for, for quite some time. And this is also an interesting example to show you how lobbyists can influence policymaking, um, good or bad, depending how you feel on the issue. Um, there's been a lot of lobbyists, Twin Pines, their lobbyists have made a lot of contributions to candidates and uh, for office and state office. Um, there's some that have personal relationships, friends, family, and those types of things. And I'm not saying that the environmental groups don't do the same things. Of course, environmental groups make donations. They have friends, family, and those types of things as well. Um, but this is one that's gotten a lot of attention um, as far as the connections and who's kind of behind the scenes and pushing for the mining and pushing to kill the legislation on the state level uh, versus who's supporting it. So like I said, I. 
it, it's kind of made made it back. And if, like I said, go to the Atlanta Journal Constitution, political cartoon is actually tied to this issue. Um, but we'll see what happens tomorrow um, if it even gets a vote tomorrow. That's a great point, Julie, about the impact of interest groups, which again, in our classes, we're getting too soon. Um, this had extraordinary bipartisan support in the House. Actually, I think over half of the House has co-sponsored the bill. And when polled, almost 70% of Georgians are in favor of perpetually protecting uh, the Okie Finoki. Uh, so it'll, it will be interesting to see with this extraordinary support, bipartisan support and popular support from Georgia voters, what will actually happen. Great. Uh, and, and just uh, in case you're not aware what titanium dioxide is, uh, it is a substance that's used a lot for whitening of things. Uh, so like white paint, um, like teeth whitening, things like that. It's used for a lot of things. So, uh, so if you see something that's white and reflective, it's probably titanium dioxide. Um, so like, you know, it's used, I think, in like some types of sunscreen and all sorts of things. So, um, so if you ever seen somebody with white, white stuff on their nose, they're 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 wearing titanium dioxide, probably. Um, in case you're not familiar with it. So. Um, and yeah, just, and Home Depot and the company that owns Sherwin Williams Paints, they've been brought into the spray mm -hmm. as well because you can use it in paint products. And so also that's kind of bringing some Georgia corporations into the conversation. Right, and there have been yeah discussions of you know potential you know boycotts and things like that uh, or or threats against companies if they use stuff from this mine and things like that. So um, so yeah, I mean I think that you know, it's definitely been a controversial issue and one that um, even if this particular uh, bill passes probably won't go away because it is looking at like a moratorium for just a few years rather than a, a long time. So it's certainly not an issue that's going to disappear. Um, uh, another issue, um, one that may be near and dear to the hearts of some people in the audience, um, gambling, gambling on sports in particular, has taken off in many states since expansion was legalized as a result, as a result of a Supreme Court ruling about uh, six years ago in a case called Murphy v. NCAA. Um, in 2018, the legislature has also been debating expanding gambling beyond the lottery for several years. Many years now, in fact, I would imagine, um, you know, going back to even why I moved here, I know they were talking about casino gambling and things like that. Sports gambling a little less, but sports gambling has been back on the radar since the Murphy decision. Um, so um, what is status, if any, of plans to expand uh, uh, sports gambling, casino gambling here in the state? I know uh, Dr. Hall has been doing a little bit of research on that, so I'll let him uh, speak yeah, on absolutely. that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'll start with the um, the court's opinion. When Congress in 1992 passed their anti-sports gambling law, um, it was not immediately challenged successfully because they passed it in 1992. Um, and I was still back in high school. Uh, but in the 21st century, 2011, the state of New Jersey challenged it. Uh, they wanted uh, and they asked the people of New Jersey uh, to, to vote for a constitutional amendment to the New Jersey Constitution to allow for sports gambling. This would go directly against the federal law that had prevented states from taking part in sports gambling. So this goes to the federal Supreme Court and the court uh, addressed this and basically struck down the federal law that had prohibited sports gambling. Specifically, it dealt with an area of constitutional law that is referred to as the commandeering doctrine or anti-commandeering doctrine. When you think of the word commandeering, imagine the federal government through federal law, forcing state governments to enact federal legislation or to do the job of the federal government. The court has long since said that that represents an unconstitutional commandeering by the federal government of state legislatures, and they do not allow for that. There are exceptions, but when it came to the ban on sports betting at the state level, the court found that Congress had gone a bridge too far and they had violated the commandeering doctrine and they recognized that states would have the constitutional right to have sports gambling. Now, I believe that today there are like 38 states. I was kind of surprised by this. Uh, around 38 states do have legal sports gambling. Georgia is looking to become the 39th. Um, and this, again, like the Okefenokee Oka legislation, uh, this has bipartisan support. I don't mean to keep jumping on bipartisan support, but in the 21st century, bipartisan support is something that's worthy of looking at. Uh, Democrats and Republicans in the state of Georgia both support 
the state of Georgia having access to sports gambling sanctioned by the state. And the major difference involves those who think it should be attached to the power that the state already has with the lottery and gambling, and those who think it should be a constitutional amendment to the state of Georgia's constitution. At the end of the day, the advocates of a constitutional amendment appear to have won out, uh, and they have put on a requirement that it be a constitutional amendment. Now, this might slow the legislation down, requiring that sports gambling be placed as an amendment to the Georgia Constitution could slow it down, but it does have a great deal of bipartisan support. So while I cannot predict with any certainty whether this will happen and whether or not Georgia will join the rest of the Republic or most of the Republic in having sports gambling, it does look like something that has legs. Um, this could raise additional billions of dollars, much of which the state wants to use in the same way we use the lottery to place it toward uh, education, uh, particularly uh, pre-K education and uh, further buttressing the, the HOPE scholarship. So we will see if this actually goes through, uh, but it is an exciting new change for the state of Georgia that many across the state are in favor of bipartisan support in the legislature. But as we've seen, that is not guarantee that it would be passed. And again, it does look like it will require a constitutional amendment. And I'll leave it to Julia or Chris to fill in any gaps there on sports gambling. Don't gamble, by the way. <laughs> no, I just wanted to actually share something from an article, if it's OK, because you know, who says politics is boring? It's not. I love this quote. So they were talking about some revisions that were made to the legislation, proposed in the legislation in committee yesterday that the House is proposing. Um, and so here's the quote. They said, putting a friendly hand on a colleague's shoulder, State Representative Marcus Widower told lawmakers illegal betting is already taking place in Georgia. Quote, Chairman Dale Washburn could be placing a bet on his phone right now and none of us would know it, Widower told the committee. I guess it's the nerd in me. I just thought that was a funny quote, but he's right. There's people that are already doing it. So kind of some of the argument that we see on betting is the same argument we see on other social type issues is that people are going to do it. They're going to find a way to do it. So let's make it legal. Let's regulate it. Let's bring that revenue in for hope. Let's bring that revenue in for pre-K. And if you don't know, Dale Washburn's from the Macon area, so... That's a great point there, um, and you brought up a great point. Uh, there's a great deal of research that goes into this. The estimates that I saw are upwards of $5 billion a year that Georgians are already spending on sports gambling. We have the internet, it, the, the secret's out. Everyone's aware of the internet. Uh, so if there's $5 billion of sports betting already happening in Georgia, that's a primary argument in favor of it. This is a similar argument that I remember from Alabama, where in terms of gambling, everything is illegal in Alabama. Uh, and many make the argument that, in terms of gambling, many make the argument that if the money is being spent already, why not take advantage? And that is one of the driving forces, one of the most important examples of the logic behind sports gambling legalization in Georgia. It's already happening, and there are hundreds of millions of dollars that Georgia could be receiving in revenue that could go to pre-K, that could go to the Hope Scholarship, that we are not taking advantage of. So that's one of the general arguments that helps to gain this bipartisan support in Atlanta, but we'll see. Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Um, you know, the only, the only thing I, I would just sort of add to this is that, you know, um, when, when people think about gambling, a lot of the time, or gaming as the gambling industry would like to get you to call it, um, you know, the, the one thing I would add is that, you know, a lot of people, they, they think of a particular type of gambling and a particular setting for gambling, and that's not always what it is. Um, you know, a good example of this is when we talk about, um, like the lottery, for example, you know, most people think, okay, well, I'm just going to go down to the, you know, convenience store and get my scratch off ticket or get a lottery ticket. Well, what they don't realize sometimes is, well, that's also something you can do on your phone. I mean, if you're in Georgia, you can, there is a Georgia lottery app that you can download from the, I'm not advertising here, the app store, and you can, you know, buy your lottery tickets there. You can, they've had, they have instant games on your phone now. Um, and you know, the same thing is sort of, I mean, the, there's a little bit of the the worry, I guess, is about gambling addiction, right? Is that, you know, people are going to, uh, and, you know, if you give people really, really easy access to gambling, um, that's not a good thing. 
uh, for some people. I mean, for uh, there's a I mean, most people will gamble responsibly and not you know lose their life savings and things like that. But there are that 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 fraction of people out there that will you know the, what the, what are sometimes called the whales that you know that, um, that you know the, this one or two percent of gamblers are are driving you know 80 90 percent of the profits that these gambling companies make and while well, some of them can afford it um because you know there are a lot of rich people out there that can they can afford to gamble you know a hundred thousand dollar hand blackjack and things like that, right? Um, or or bet a million dollars on the Super Bowl or something like that. Um, not all the whales are that, right? Um, and so, um, so, so the, I mean, there, are, of course, there are, you know, historically Georgia's a fairly conservative state. There are religious and uh, moral concerns that they come to fore as well. So, um, Particularly if it comes to trying to amend the constitution to state constitution to do this, um, you know that could be a barrier to to the bill passing, right? And I think that's part of the reason, perhaps, why um, why some people are insisting on having a, a constitutional amendment is to make it less likely that it'll pass. So um, that said, it does seem like the momentum is towards this, and you know, I guess trying to figure out ways to uh, mitigate the the potential problems and also as you know both uh dr hall and dr lester point out people are already doing it right um you know i know i you know i, I knew people well before to the 2018 they were routinely making bets on on sports um you know back then it was offshore booking you know uh, you know going through the caymans and stuff like this um you know the bahamas and they had their apps and um you know, um, and before before the Supreme Court decision, uh, you know, really gambling on sports was only legal. I think two states, um, uh, Delaware and um, um, uh, um, Nevada. Right. Um, and so um, and didn't ta- it took a while for it to really take off even beyond those two states. Um, but um, but, you know, um, anyway, um Reminder again, uh, chat is open for for questions. You all been a very quiet crowd. Um, not that's necessarily a bad thing, but um, but we do have uh, plenty to talk about. Um, but but again, you know, if you have questions, we're we're happy to follow up on it. Um, let's see. So healthcare, big issue in in Georgia, particularly in rural Georgia. Uh, a lot of people have been concerned about rural hospitals closing. A lot of people have been concerned about um rural hospitals you know not having business um and that sort of thing um you know sometimes that's um you know they relocated to greener pastures within the county um you know those of you in peach county will know that the the hospital in peach county used to be in fort valley and now it's basically more robbins um so better not have a heart attack in fort valley i guess um uh, I mean, it is close enough, maybe, but I wouldn't want to, you know, I wouldn't want to risk it. Um, so, so obviously, healthcare is, uh, you know, an issue for people in rural counties and under, um, you know, south side of Atlanta. I know the the big hospital there closed a couple years ago, and people are uh, deeply concerned about that. Um, the legislature is looking at solutions to this problem, or, but how are they doing anything to? tackle the issues of rural health care and also just health care access for people that are um, not um, able to afford it. Uh, Great I don't question. know whose turn um, it is. I think it's Don. Uh, well, John was talking, so we'll let Don, John talk. <laughs> um, one of the most important elements of health care reform, it, it, it starts and stops with the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act passed by the Obama administration. Whether you're in favor or against, one thing is true. The court upheld its constitutionality, but it also said that mandating that states increase their Medicaid roles was an unconstitutional violation of state government power. So since then, all states have the opportunity to voluntarily opt in to the Medicaid expansion. So far, I believe as of now, there are 38 states in the District of Columbia that have opted into the Medicaid expansion of the Affordable Care Act. Georgia is one of the states that has not. Regardless of your thoughts for, against, or what your um, personal opinions may be on expanding Medicaid under the Affordable Care Act, one thing is true, and that is that numbers don't lie. There are billions of dollars from the federal government 
sitting there that Georgia does not have access to because we have not yet joined the Medicaid expansion program. I'm not advocating that we do or don't. These are just the facts of the issue. There was a proposal to finally fully expand Georgia's Medicaid under the Affordable Care Act, and it failed. So as far as that's concerned, that is over for yet another legislative session. There have been several other uh, legislative actions to improve or to address uh, health care reform. Um, the first one, and we might talk about this a little bit later, is within the boundaries of health-related legislation, um, uh, two Senate bills that are politically uh, extraordinarily uh, polarizing, and that is Georgia's stance on uh, gender affirming care. Uh, that is something that has already been passed and that the governor has already signed, and that is a ban on gender affirming care for Georgians under the age of, of 18. Not necessarily legislation that is directly related to impacting rural health care, but it definitely affects transgender George, uh, transgender Georgians across the entire state. So that's something that uh, will definitely garner more national news. Um, there are several other uh, pieces of legislation. Again, the, the biggest uh, issue item was the inability uh, to expand Medicaid. Uh, there are a lot of different directions I can go here. I want to stop and make sure I'm not leaving anything out. Dr. Lester or Chris, if y'all want to join in. I kind of wanted to join in a little bit about the certificate of need, maybe I think that might be something to mention. Um, this is an issue that came up in the last legislative session and again going back to the Senate and Burr Jones's relationship with them as being lieutenant governor. This was important for him as lieutenant governor to to get this legislation passed. Um, you can look into the history of Burt Jones and his family. If you, but what a certificate of need is, is basically um, a permit. That's the best way probably to explain for healthcare facilities. And so what happens is you're demonstrating a need for healthcare in these, these areas. And as we know with uh, COVID and health, the healthcare system in the United States in general, of course, COVID put an extra strain on it. A lot of healthcare facilities in rural Georgia closed and there's a, there's, for the lack of a better phrase, we always use that phrase deserts, like food deserts. There's healthcare deserts in, in especially in rural Georgia and rural South Georgia, especially. And so the argument for loosening up these requirements for the certificate of need is that we're going to be able to open medical facilities in these areas that may have once been served, but for whatever reason, the hospital, the medical facilities had to close down, but we can reopen them maybe quicker because there's not going to be as much red tape in opening them. So so there's still a demonstrated need. And the hospital, an example that's being used is a uh, hospital in Cuthbert, Georgia, which is in the far southwest part of the state. And so, again, this has been an issue for years. They had a study committee. A study committee made recommendations. And um, we'll see what ends up being the final, final call on this piece of legislation. But that's a way to kind of bring health care access back to areas, especially of rural Georgia, that maybe um, are too far away to access Atlanta or Macon or Warner Robins or those types of things. So that's gotten a lot of the attention beyond uh, Medicaid expansion. Uh, yeah, that's a that's a good point. Yeah, the, the whole certificate of need issue, like I said, that kind of relates to what I was talking about with, you know, um, Peach County and the medical center there and that sort of thing where, um, you know, although they didn't locate outside the county, right, you know, you could argue and maybe there's still a need in, in Fort Valley for, um, you know, emergency care that, although it's just up the road, nonetheless, um, you know, every minute, as they say, when you're having a heart attack or something, every second counts, right? And so, um, and even in a place like, you know, Macon, you know, you have, yes, we have several hospitals here and strong, you know, a lot of good medical facilities, but, um, but again, you know, those can be overstrained by emergencies and things like that. Um, on the flip side though, you know, then, you know, hospitals do, even if they're nonprofits or not for profit, still have to, you know, bring in revenue to cover their expenses. And so there's a concern that, um, you know, if you have too much expansion that could um, either cherry pick pa patients from, hospitals that are on the brink um, and make things worse 
um, or sometimes you know there's a there's a fear that PA, that new hospitals or facility uh, what are called ambulatory surgery facilities and things like that might uh, what we call cherry pick patients essentially you know take the profitable patients away leave patient you know, leave leave hospitals with the charity patients the patients that cannot afford their bills and that sort of thing and you know that's one of the problems that or one of the issues that led to the the closure of the hospital on the south side of Atlanta was that you know they just simply weren't getting enough patients that could pay their bills um and so the company that that owned the hospital just basically said we can't make money here we can't you know and nobody else wanted to take it over. Nobody else was uh, was willing to take on that responsibility. And so, going back to the question about Medicaid expansion, right? One of the arguments for that is, well, then you know, if if we were able to expand Medicaid, presumably, a lot of people that can't pay their me- medical bills now would now be in, at least somebody would be paying them, right? The government would be paying them. Um, the insurers that are contracted by the government would be paying them, um, and. You know, at the end of the day, the charity care that these hospitals are doing, I mean, we're already paying them anyway, right? Uh, at the end of the day, you know, uh, now it's just people that have insurance that are paying it indirectly, people that have Medicare are paying it indirectly, people that have other sorts of uh, medical care or pay- insurance are paying it indirectly. It's why, you know, why the cash price for medical care is so high is partially because they have to p- cover the um the people that don't have insurance or that sort of thing and won't pay and so um so there aren't a lot of i I won't pretend there are any easy answers to this um, issue although certainly from a short-term state perspective i guess the easy answer would just be take the money um um which you know i think a lot of people would say yeah um but there are some downsides there right that you're kind of putting yourself in a position where once you've expanded it you can't really take it back right um you know if the federal government were to decide down the road that it can't afford these programs anymore um or wants to cut back the reimbursement for expanded medicaid uh to the level that it is for traditional medicaid uh, which is only like 50 percent um you know states already are kind of on the hook for medical expenses as dr uh, hall pointed out earlier right it's the second biggest part of our budget already um you know if we expand medicaid and then suddenly the federal government turns around and says psych we're not giving you 40 percent of the money we promised um that would not be good for our state budget right um particularly given that the states uh, almost all the states have to have a balanced budget right they'd have to either raise taxes a lot or or cut spending um and that would probably cut spending on things like education and uh, the other big ticket items there simply aren't you know i mean um there aren't a lot of places to to cut uh or or find more money uh, uh in a state budget right um yeah we're we already run a pretty lean ship here in georgia so um and and there you know um so pl- uh, on the other side the political argument would be well you know it would be hard for the federal government to cut back just simply because so many states are depending on this money and there'd be political pressure not to and you can have those arguments back and forth you know um but but it is worth noting and um you know um and, and you know that, like i said that's kind of the point that somebody else I mean, in the chat is you know that basically that you know hospitals if they were getting medicaid money it would be you know they they would you know perhaps be in better shape um and that that's certainly been the argument from people like um there's the uh georgia budget policy center i can't remember gppi i think is there an acronym uh, you know that's kind of their point they are a progressive or, or left-wing organization or liberal organization whatever you want to call them uh that um that has been advocating for uh, you know, expansion of Medicaid, and that would certainly be their argument, and certainly a lot of Democrats in the legislature would make that argument, but um, but that argument has not been persuasive to the governor, who has his own Medicaid expansion plan that's had some limited success, um, I think it would be the charitable way to put it, um, and um, yeah, so um, again, I feel like I'm a little bit on a soapbox here, even though I'm kind of making an argument, I don't know, I don't, it, you know, I, I'm kind of on the fence on it. I can see both sides of the argument, but um, but at the same time, financially at least, it seems like a no-brainer to take the money. But um, but that's you know, um, but I but I can certainly see the the other side of that argument. Um, so uh, shifting gears a lot, although to something that uh, Dr. Hall has mentioned already, um, 
the last few days, there's been extensive coverage of so-called uh, several so-called Frankenstein bills. Um, so uh, after, well, technically Frankenstein's monster, I guess. Uh, you know, that's the old uh, uh, college cliches, right? It's not Frankenstein. The, the monster is Frankenstein's monster. That's not uh, Frankenstein was the doctor. Um, but uh, Frankenstein bills is kind of the name that stuck, I guess, even though a lot of the legislature went to college. Um, and uh, these uh, seem to be being promoted uh, or being used to promote certain priorities of the GOP majority, particularly on social issues. Um, for those of you that are not familiar, Lieutenant Governor Jones is one of the likely candidates to succeed Governor uh, Kemp as governor, because Governor Kemp is uh, term limited, cannot run for election in the next election in 2028. And so uh, Lieutenant Governor Jones seems to be one of the people that's positioned themselves to run for governor, along with uh, some other folks um, that um, we don't really need to get into. But I'm sure everybody in the legislature would like to be governor as well. Um, and so um, taking some positions on some social issues is not um, not a bad way to win yourself a Republican primary these days. Um, so um, first, why are we calling them Frankenstein bills? Um, and second, uh, what are some examples? What would they do? Wherever they come from, what are they doing? That sort of thing. I think I'm repeating myself. Great question, Chris. Uh, regarding the Frankenstein bills, and this is again something we cover in class when we go over the legislative branch. Um, when we look at certain legislation that could be advantageous and popular with a large group of people, if you were to add something to that that might not be popular with half of the electorate or more than half the electorate, uh, that can get you an amalgamation of legislation that is made up of a lot of strange different parts that might resemble something like Frankenstein. Uh, for example, if I were to ask any Georgia voters, what do you think about the opioid, the opioid epidemic? Uh, and do we need legislation uh, that can provide for opioid overdose prevention? I think the average voter in Georgia, whether they be Democrat or Republican, uh, would be overwhelmingly in favor of that. And the House has passed legislation that will provide for opioid overdose prevention. However, added to that legislation, is a ban on puberty blocking medications uh, and other healthcare reform efforts for transgender youth. So that is a perfect example of um, Frankenstein laws, Frankenstein bills, where you have a piece of legislation that's designed to do one thing, but you add something to it that doesn't necessarily have a lot to do with it. Uh, regardless of anyone's opinions on uh, minors uh, having access uh, to gender affirming care or gender affirming medicine, uh, opioid overdoses and gender affirming care really don't have a great deal to do with one another. So that's a great example. Julie, I can open it up to everyone else for any other examples. Or Chris? No, I think I think that's a, you know, the Frankenstein bills, Franken bills, whatever you want to call it. Um, because in Georgia, what we do, the going backpedaling a little bit about the legislative session, so about halfway in, a little more than halfway in, we have what's called crossover day. So traditionally, that's the day if you think your bill is going to have any chance of making it somewhere, it's got to survive crossover day. Now, there are some few, which means crossing from one chamber to the other. So a bill that was introduced in the House crossover day into the Senate or introduced in the Senate crossover into the House by this deadline. I believe it was February 29th this year. Um, so now... Sometimes bills that don't survive crossover day do get life at the end of the session. Actually, like the Okie Finoki mining bill got life at the end of the session, but very, very rarely does that happen. So here I am. I, let's pretend I'm a state legislator and I had an agenda. I wanted a bill passed to do X thing. It didn't survive crossover day, but I've got enough people on my side and they're supporting my issue. So what are we going to do for the lack of a better word? We're going to hijack another piece of legislation in committee and we're going to add all of these things, whether they're a ban on puberty blocking medications or this bill that was supposed to be dealing with um, ensuring that high school athletes had access to mental health care and suicide prevention. Now that's a Franken bill where there's bans on transgender youth in sports, bathroom bans. Um, so 
that's what happens with these Franken bills. People that do have agendas, whatever the agenda they may be, uh, but these are just the issues in this session that we're seeing, and they attach them to other bills. They substitute it in committee is what it's called. And so you may be doing research and you're looking and you're saying, oh, HB 1104, yeah, that's great. It's about mental health care for student athletes. Well, that's how it was introduced in committee. That's how it initially was. But if I go look at HB 1104 when it was first introduced and to what HB 1104 looks like now, it's a complete different piece of legislation and that's because of this process of um, changing bills substitute it's called substitution and so if you're actually doing research on this make sure that you always look on on the page read the current version that's what it says this is current version because a lot of times things get changed even at the very last minute there's substitutions and changes but that's that's kind of what Franken bills are. And that's a way that some of these social issues have been pushed through in a way that, again, no matter how you feel about the issue, that a lot of times the general public might not know about because they're not following politics as closely. So they may not know these substitutions are going on. Uh, yeah, that's a good point. In fact, you know, the legislative process is, um, you know, here in Georgia and a lot of states, uh, you know, is um, is uses this process you know, quite a lot, right? Um, you know, where a bill is, you know, um, one of two things, either it's a very uh, innocuous sort of bill that gets, you know, hijacked and turned into something else, sometimes without the author's knowledge or consent even, uh, but also there are kind of dummy bills that are used kind of the same way where the legislature will introduce bills and then they will get amended later on into something else. It's done a lot in the budget process, done a lot for like taxes and things like that, um, where you have a bill that sends them, you know, and the reason for this is essentially, um, well, there are a couple of reasons. First is, uh, as uh, you may be aware, most, well, at the federal level and, and in Georgia and most states, there are rules about where bills have to originate to be able to do certain things. Uh, so, for example, you know, revenue bills, bills on taxes have to originate in the House of Representatives in Georgia, as well as at the federal level. Uh, and so, you know, if you are a senator and you want to introduce a bill that's going to raise taxes or lower taxes, you can't do that, right? And so you have to hijack somebody else's bill that passed the House to do that if you want to, you know, have a tax bill, for example. Um, and so that's one possibility. The other reason is, you know, to, to get it in the subject matter of a particular committee, right? So if you're a powerful committee chair, you want to make sure that um, you know, you can propose legislation on a particular topic. You need a bill that's been referred to your committee to be able to do that, right? Um, and so, uh, again, the opportunity for these Franken bills is very much dependent on uh, this uh, this process. Um, you know, I was reading. Earlier. You're muted, Chris. Oh, oh, sorry. One of the bills I saw in the process actually in my space bar was, um, you know, something that was going to introduce or uh, raise judicial salaries. Um, but the bill actually started out as a bill on a completely unrelated topic. I can't even remember what it was. Um, you know, um, and and the title still reflects that. Right. And I looked at the title of this bill. And they're like, Clearly, they're linking to the wrong bill here because uh, the title made absolutely no sense. But when you click through, like Dr. Lester said to the. Uh, uh, current version of the bill is like, oh, now it's about judicial salaries. Now that makes sense. But the original version of the bill had nothing to do with salaries or judges or anything. I can't even remember what it was. It was something you know completely off the wall. Um, um, and, and, you know, a good example of one that we had in the list here was, you know, the House Bill 301, which was originally a bill about illegally passing school buses and raising the penalty for that. Uh, that turned into a sanctuary cities bill. <laughs> um, you know, completely unrelated topic. Um, you know, I mean, I guess you could argue maybe because it's raising the fine for something, it's the same thing. But um, and this is the uh, example of one of the, kind of the clever tricks that legislatures have to do to get around legal or constitutional restrictions or rules and the rules that um, limit, you know, the subject matter to a particular area or that sort of thing. You can get really arcane with this stuff. Uh, particularly on the state. Um, Georgia doesn't have as many arcane rules as some other states, and so you can get some really arcane stuff in some other states where 
Um, you know, bills are used for all sorts of crazy purposes. Um, let's see. Um, again, reminder, uh, we're taking questions in the chat. Uh, we have about 25 more minutes. Um, so taxes, everybody's favorite thing. Um, what's the what's the deal with taxes? What's the legislature doing with tax policy? And sorry, we were we were doing some Seinfeld jokes earlier. Um, what's the deal with taxes? Um, so what is the legislature doing about tax policy? I know there's been some uh, discussion about uh, uh, trying to, particularly property taxes. A lot of people are concerned about property taxes because um, for those of you that don't own property or those of you that haven't looked at real estate prices lately, uh, uh, real estate's gotten some some darn expensive uh, in the last few years. Um, during COVID, apparently nobody was moving and everybody just wanted to live in their house and it was hard to buy a house. And so prices for houses went up and nobody was building new houses. And so if you have a, if you bought a house before COVID, uh, you rich. Um, but if you're rich on paper, that also means that, hey, they're coming for you for some taxes and people aren't happy about getting those taxes. So what's the legislature going to do to stop me from getting taxed out of my house? Dang it. Somebody help me. <laughs> so thinking about taxes, everybody loves taxes. So uh, if I could see you all and ask for a show of hands who loves taxes. So as you know, if you are a homeowner or even renters have been affected by this, because obviously you're not paying the county for property taxes, but you know your landlord's charging you for them and your rent, and that may be why your rent's going up. Um, so there's been some legislation proposed tied to um, homestead exemption and capping assessments. So getting back to the homestead exemption, um, that's an exemption that counties have on your property tax bill. Um, they wanted to, they being the legislature, wanted to um, pass legislation, a bill that was introduced that would increase the homestead exemption from $2,000 to $4,000. Now, counties have had some flexibility. Some counties have higher homestead exemptions than $4,000. Um, so um, those that are uh, supportive of, of counties and want counties to maintain power, they, they actually have advocated for an opting out of that um, increase and giving counties more power to decide because here's what happens um, when you're thinking about um, homestead exemptions if you're not your house value is not assessed as much and you're not paying as much taxes on your property taxes have to come from other things whether it's sales taxes or um, uh, it's the most popular uh, way to to raise so that's one piece of legislation so um, so changing the homestead exemption that property owners can get. Um, and I would also encourage you, if you are a property owner and you qualify for a homestead exemption and you have not completed the paperwork with your county officer office, tax office, tax assessor office, do so because last year um, as part of the Kemp money giveaway, those people that did own homesteaded property did get a little bit of help when it came tax time. So this is just my wanting to put more money into your wallet if you are a homeowner. Um, another piece of legislation uh, tied to uh, property taxes deals with assessment. So again, as you know, property values are assessed. Now some counties are really good about assessing property values in a timely manner. Some counties wait for years. Um, I have lived in my current home for over a decade and um, I've only been assessed once, reassessed once the value. And this was pre-COVID. Guess what's happening to me next year? We get a new property value assessment in this market. So yeah, we're not looking forward to that bill whenever it comes next year. So what this new legislation would do, it would actually cap assessment. So your value could not go up by more than 3% each year. So, you know, we may be facing on our property a 25 to 30% increase in the assessed value, or maybe even more, depending on who you talk to. Well, if this piece of legislation was passed, um, in the future, it would be capped at only 3%, which again, makes it more affordable for those property owners to be able to handle the increase in, in taxes each year. But again, thinking about how government funds itself, property taxes, so 
there's kind of looking at both sides of the issue. So um, those are two of the big things that we've looked at as far as property taxation goes. Um, taxation, income tax, uh, I don't want to move too far off the topic here. There's um, been talk for years about reducing the income tax rate in the state of Georgia, um, a phased reduction. Now, some people want to get rid of it completely, um, but there's phased reduction and that did pass. Um, so we're going to have a small cut in our income tax rate um, the next year. Um, but again, taxes pay for government services. So we're looking at that. That's going to affect the budget. Um, depending what the economy does, that's going to affect the budget. So fewer taxes, less revenue, less services. So it's all connected to each other. That was incredibly thorough, Dr. Lester. I have very, very little to add. Um, I was going to talk about the phase reduction in the state income taxes, and that has passed. There's also an attempt at decreasing uh, the state's corporate income tax, which when you look at the, we, we can talk about taxes. Uh, Chris, I think I'd sent you another uh, little flyer that shows uh, the breakdown of revenue. When it comes to the money uh, brought in by the state of Georgia, we have personal income taxes, we have corporate income taxes, uh, personal income taxes represent almost 44% of every penny that the state of Georgia brings in in revenue. Uh, corporate income taxes represent a little over 8%. So personal income taxes are like almost five times uh, larger in terms of revenue brought in than corporate income taxes. We also have sales taxes, which uh, you were dis uh, discussing. Uh, they represent almost a quarter of revenue coming in. Uh, and then we have other taxes, fees, and interest that bring in the other 14 percent. Uh, so when it comes to revenue, as Dr. Lester pointed out, that, yep, there it is right there. Um, it does represent the services that the state of Georgia will be able to provide. So while no one likes paying taxes in a civilized society, we all recognize that they do exist for a reason. And there are several uh, legislative efforts at reducing several of these taxes, particularly corporate income tax, some personal income tax, and sales taxes. Yeah, that's a that's a good point. Um, yeah, and you know, if you just want to compare this to the federal level, I just happened to be talking to my Congress class about the uh, taxes and where they come from at the federal level today. Um, you know, um, compared to the federal level, uh, you know, the state uh, gets a little bit less of a percentage of its money from income tax. Um, so at the federal level, about half of uh, the federal's you know, government's income is from uh, personal income tax, and another nine percent is corporate income tax. Um, you know, the big difference is the state doesn't or the state relies a lot also on sales taxes um, and the federal government doesn't do sales tax at all. Right. So, um, so that's a huge difference. So, you know, we could talk more about federal taxes and things like that, but not really you know, in the scope of uh, today's uh, discussion. Um, but I do want to address a couple of things uh, very briefly uh, about um property tax, just kind of things people may not know, particularly if you're not a homeowner or you've not learned about how homeowners work here in Georgia uh, or or property tax works in Georgia. Georgia has a very weird property tax compared to other states, I think. Um, maybe I'm speaking a little out of turn in terms of how it works, but having owned houses in other states um, uh, and looked at property taxes in other states, Georgia does some weird things. Um, so first thing is the proper, uh, the uh, homestead exemption in Georgia is unusually low, I would say, compared to a lot of other states. Um, you know, a lot of states, again, it's often like like a quarter of the value of your house and things like that. Um, here in Georgia, $2,000, particularly when it sounds like $2,000, so I'll explain that in a moment, uh, doesn't sound like a lot. Um, and it isn't a lot. Um, it's never been indexed to inflation or anything like that. And so while it might have been fairly generous when it was introduced, uh, it is not anymore, um, particularly in metro Atlanta and places where property is a lot more valuable than it is in uh, middle Georgia. Um, the other thing is that um, household property, uh, different types of property are assessed at different percentages of their true value in Georgia. And so um, household property, I think, is at 40 percent of its true value, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and so you may think that you're, ha you're ha for example, if you had a house that was worth, say, $200,000, um, you would think that you pay taxes on $200,000. Um, but that's not what you pay taxes on. You actually pay taxes on 40% of that. And so what you really pay taxes on is 
forty percent of the assessed value, and so uh, and that two thousand is based on assessed value. So really, if you can't do the math, the two thousand dollar exemption is really closer to a five thousand dollar exemption on the value, the true value of your property. Um, there are other types of property that also are assessed at different percentages. So, for example, agricultural property is assessed at a pretty low rate, um, um, and so. Um, the other thing is homestead exemption, uh, I, you know, if you're not familiar with it. So uh, so this is based on your primary. You can get a homestead exemption for your primary home if you live in it for the whole year. Um, so if you buy a house in the middle of the year, you don't get the homestead exemption until the following tax year. And like Dr. Lester pointed out, uh, you do have to apply for that exemption. Uh, and there is uh, I believe there's also a deadline for doing so. And so if you don't apply early enough in the year, you don't get it for the following year either. So um, I want to say it's the end of this month, if I'm not mistaken. It's like uh, now that may vary by county. So so check with your county tax assessor and tax collector who may or may not be the same person um, and, and, and do that if you do own property or know people that own property or that sort of thing. Um, and of course, back when uh, cars were, I guess if you have a really old car, I guess it still has property tax. But um, and so this also applies if you have a boat, things like that. Property tax applies to that. So so things to to be aware of as well. Um, and there are a few counties like uh, Bibb County, for example, the exempt uh, that raised its uh, or was able to lower its property taxes by sales tax and things like that. Um, you know, we we could talk about. Sploss and things like that. I don't know if anybody wants to talk about that, but uh, we could. Um, let's see. We have chat. Uh, no, just somebody saying they're signing off. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, on to uh, local government stuff. So, um, Dr. Lawrence. Yes. This Hi, is uh, David Beek. I'm sorry to interject, but I, I it might be fun for folks. And I see you've got a bunch of people on here. Just go on Zillow and look up an equivalent house in New Jersey or Connecticut, and it, it'll list the estimated property taxes. And you know, a, a typical house up, up in uh, up in uh, Westchester, New York, for example, might uh, might be one thousand dollars, which is not out of the question anymore for for even uh, you know in Middle Georgia. And you might pay twenty thousand dollars a year in t property taxes alone. So. You know, that, that's one way to check some of the things you were just talking about, which was excellent, by the way. Yeah, it's a good point. Um, and, and a lot of states, you know, there, there are some states like New Jersey, for example, that are very reliant on property taxes. And so, you know, if you know anybody that lives in New Jersey and talk to them about their property taxes, I mean, one, they, they will yell and scream about it for several minutes. So make sure your phone's far away from your head when you do that. Um, but the other thing is that um, they are people that are very affected by a, a federal tax change that took place under the Trump administration a few years ago uh, that limits how much you can deduct, deduct on your taxes uh, for state and local taxes. And so there's like now a $10,000 cap on your deductions there. And well, that doesn't affect very many people here in Georgia, for example, um, uh, because our state and local ta taxes are not that high, relatively speaking. Um, you know, people in New Jersey, um, you know, there was a lot of yelling and screaming from New Jersey uh, because, uh, you know, local governments in New Jersey are very reliant on property taxes and um, and don't get a lot of money from the state, apparently, for and don't have don't levy income taxes and things like that. And so um I'm not sure why why New Jersey in particular has a tax structure that's like that, but also, and that's of course compounded by the fact that property values in New Jersey are very inflated compared to what they are here as well. Um, partially that just comes down to people earning more money up there, but uh, a lot, of, but uh, and cost of living in general, but um, but they're also just property in general. I guess because of supply and things like that is. Um, very expensive as well as as uh, you know, Doctor Doctor Beek points out, you know, in New England and um, uh, the northern the Mid Atlantic states um, and California, a few other states as well. Um, let's see. Um, so on to uh, I guess we've already talked a little. We're talking kind of about local government already uh, in terms of tax policy and the homestead exemption and things like that. Um, so I know Dr. Lester want to talk a little bit about some other things that are being considered that might affect uh, local government, intergovernmental relations. So those of you that are not familiar with 
how Georgia government works. You know, um, you know, Georgia is divided into a bunch of counties and a bunch of um, and most of many of us live in municipalities within those counties as well. And they uh, they have their own local governments that are theoretically or as practically as well subservient to the state government, but also have relations with the state government um, and they're affected by things the legislature does just as much as anybody else. Um, so what are some of the things that um, may be affecting them that um, you want to talk about? Okay, first of all, going back to the taxes, April 1st is the deadline for the homestead exemption paperwork. I went to the Department of Revenue's website and that's what it said. So just Fun fact for everybody. Um, as far as thinking about local government, we've actually some of the issues we've touched on are local government issues like the um, the ranked choice voting and it's not there was a bill even to ban it in municipalities. So taking away the power of cities um, to actually have those types of elections. Um, so as Dr. Lawrence said, there's a lot of counties, there's a lot of municipalities, there's 159 counties in the state of Georgia and there's 537 municipalities. So 530 cities. So that is a lot of government um, because there's very few that are actually consolidated. So um, when you get a lot of hands in the pot, it can get complicated <laughs> whenever it becomes time to make policy when it times comes time to implement policy that's handed down by the state so probably i would say um, one of the biggest um, issues tied to local government in this session is related to service delivery strategy um, it's a hot mess that's the best way to explain it um what service delivery strategies are it's just what it sounds like uh, who is going to have the responsibility for delivering services between a county and a municipality that's that's all it is so services can be uh, a lot of different things whether it's tax collection running elections who's going to run the animal shelter who's going to run the recreation center um, if you live in a probably I'd say a smaller county and smaller municipalities, the counties may take on those functions, but the larger cities um, and um, counties, you, the municipalities oftentimes take on those responsibilities. So um, going back to the 1990s, the Service Delivery Strategy Act was passed to clarify which government was going to be responsible for what services. Um, and so basically it's a contract um, that that municipalities and counties um, reach agreement on on the service delivery and the the intent was this flexible framework uh, for local governments to agree on who's going to be delivering services and to minimize any duplication or competition if you're in a county of 40,000 people and you've got three municipalities you're probably not going to have three in the largest municipalities, 18,000 people, it probably doesn't make sense to have three different animal shelters. So you'll have one. So what would happen in that county is that the municipalities, the three municipalities would contract with the county to provide um, animal shelter, animal services, or recreation services, because it doesn't make sense to have, you know, three mighty might football leagues for each little municipality, because you're only going to get maybe five five young people per municipality. So you're doing things uh, county-wise. So, so this is good in a way, um, but what happens, um, a lot of conflict because these service delivery strategies need to be renegotiated. And as we've talked about a lot, um, services require tax dollars to be delivered. So um, I don't know of any government that wants to give up tax dollars just say, hey, take all my money. Um, so if, for example, a county is providing a service, um, they want to ensure, the cities want to ensure that the county is being responsible with that money that they're providing to the county as part of the service delivery strategy. Um, and this is where debates and fights over how local option sales tax money is going to be spent uh, and, and so on. So, and the theme of the day seems to be study committees. There was a study committee um, the last year, and they came up with some recommendations about how to improve service delivery strategies, uh, which is important because 
you may think, oh, let's just get rid of them. Well, no, you have to have these contracts. And also, too, you have to have these contracts between cities and counties to qualify for grant money from the state and other types of programs. So um, recognizing the conflict um, that happens with service delivery strategy in counties, especially when it comes time to deal with uh, sales tax and, and other service delivery, um, there was a case, Winder versus Barrow, um, the Supreme Court of Georgia heard and recently handed down a decision um, related to their, their service delivery strategy. And so kind of thinking about that and that case that was going to be for the state Supreme Court and issues that we saw in multiple counties during the loss negotiations last year, a uh, bill was introduced that actually set some standards about when the negotiations have to begin for the service delivery strategy. So you renegotiate these every few years. And also to what types of circumstances may um, happen that would require a change. So for example, um, maybe a municipality has a growth spurt of 10,000 people over five years. That's gonna change the agreement and what needs to be done. Um, also too, um, Mapping out the service area in the service delivery strategy. So where do the city's responsibilities begin and end? Where does the counties begin and end? Because um, some cities are not really well mapped out. The boundaries, I live in a city where there's actually a hotel where some of the rooms are in the county and some of the rooms are actually in the city. Um, and if you ever want to hear crazy stories about that, I have some pretty interesting stories about police responding to crime and and in those locations. Um, so you're you're mapping out these geographic areas to help you better understand. Also, too, uh, more transparency because all the parties in the negotiation are going to have to provide everyone else with written analysis of all the services that they provide and the proposed funding sources, and they have to enter into that and. Um, then there's also ways for the cities and counties to deal with disagreements that didn't exist before as far as um, petitioning the courts to handle the disagreements um, and also to uh, a finalization of the strategy because sometimes there has to be a hard deadline. Um, there are cities and counties out there that their SDS, that's what they're called, their SDS is not updated and they're still bickering about it and who's going to do what and who's going to get the money and hey let's sue each other um again i'm live in a location where there's a lawsuit that was started in 2018 and a lot of it's tied to service delivery between the city and the largest municipality that court case is still being litigated 2018 we're in 2024 so um, the the changes suggested by the study committee were actually supported by both the Georgia Municipal Association, which represents the cities, and the Association of County Commissioners of Georgia, which represents the county. So this is again showing where parties on both sides of the table are working together to try to figure out a way to minimize conflict and ensure that service delivery is provided in an efficient manner and um, the manner that's best for the majority of the citizens that they serve. Fantastic summary. I couldn't add anything to it. And I just noticed that we are almost out of time. I did point uh, notice uh, Dr. Beek's suggestion earlier. I was not able to cross-reference multiple states, but that is a very interesting tool. I'm sure we all have Zillow. Actually, if you're 18 or 19, you may not, but if you do, uh, you can really see uh, some differentiation in property taxes at the state level on that relatively popular app. But since we are running out of time, I will I will be quiet. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Hall uh, and, and Dr. Lester. Um, yeah, a couple of things I just want to very briefly clarify for anybody that may not be familiar. Uh, so uh, Dr. Lester uses term lost. Uh, so local option sales tax. Um, so um, so in addition to the uh, state sales tax, um, uh, local municipalities and counties can levy some uh, various local option sales taxes as well that have various uh, sometimes rude sounding acronyms. Um, so if you've ever heard somebody talk about a, a SPLOST or a T-SPLOST or a LOST or a, um, there's a bunch of them, a host. Um, there the are newly a, proposed FLOST. 
That's flossed. the new one. Flossed. Um, so, um, you know, uh, make sure you flossed before you go to dinner um, or, or, you know, go to bed or whatever. Um, so, yeah, they're, they're the, the lost algorithm or the the OSTs, the optional sales taxes. Um, that's one of those algor- uh, acronyms uh, you'll hear a lot in uh, uh, or if you get involved in paying attention to local government. And, um, you know, le- like Dr. Lester said, with so many counties, and so many municipalities, right, um, you know, Again, you know, that choice between having a consolidated government like Macon Bib does and having a, a separate levels of government like, say, Houston County or Peach County or, or, or Tiff County or a lot of other counties, um, you know, uh, is an important one, right? Um, and that's one of the things that perhaps motivated uh, consolidation in Macon and also in Columbus, a few other places where just simply it was uh, simpler uh, to not have these sort of interlevel debates, although there are also downsides to consolidation as well that uh, we could certainly get into if we had a lot more time, which we don't. Um, so, but um, if you are interested in some of the downsides of consolidation, uh, feel free to take uh, Dr. Lester's class on uh, state and local government in the se- in, in the fall. I'm sure she'll talk about consolidation there uh, as a theme. Um, Let's see. Um, so, uh, so I'd like to thank everybody for coming out today um, and participating. Uh, we will get a recording of this posted uh, at some point. I will not try to bring up the thing because that will just take more time. Um, but I do want to just briefly mention we do have uh, uh, a presence on social media. So MGA Pulsei on Facebook, on YouTube, and on Twitter slash X. Uh, we are not on um Instagram. We are not on TikTok since we're probably going to get banned from TikTok anyway. Amen. Now, anyway, um, there is one last thing I did want to, or a couple things. Uh, also, um, uh, we do have a future event coming up in a couple of weeks. We have a panel from our department at the uh, undergraduate conference on Wednesday, April 10th at 4 p.m., where several of us will be uh, speaking. Um, and I'm not entirely sure about all the details there, but I'll have to follow up with some people on that. Um, but I know that um, uh, at, well, originally the plan was to have some people talk about international politics, but that's not what actually the title of the panel is. So I'm going to have to figure out what's going on there. Um, but there will be a panel. There will be a reception afterwards. It will be at the undergraduate conference, 4 p.m. on April 10th in the uh, Arts Complex Theater in the School of Arts and Letters building. Um, also, uh, I did want—I don't want to end on a sad note, but uh, some news did pass the wire a few minutes ago that is worth noting. Um, those of you that are older that were around in uh, 2000 will remember that Al Gore's running mate was a senator from uh, Connecticut, uh, Joe Lieberman, um, who uh, then was uh, challenged for re-election and ended up being re-elected to the Senate as an independent from Connecticut. Um, he uh, passed away at the age of, I believe, 83 today. So, uh, so if you see flags at half mast and things like that around over the next few weeks, that's why. Um, so, um, um, anyway, um, so um, those of you maybe from Connecticut may may be more familiar with him. So, um, in any event, I just wanted to pass that along as a bit of news uh, and. Um, Thank you all for coming out today. Um, for those of you that need uh, credit and things like that, do post in the chat. If you are not in your uh, uh, logged in under your real name, um, if you're here for some sort of extra credit or something, post that. Um, other than that, uh, thank you all for joining us, and uh, we'll go ahead and adjourn. And hopefully, we'll see all of you in a, or we some of you in a couple of weeks at our event um, on the on the tenth. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Julie. Thank you all.